America stood. America voted. America has spoken. The National Coalition Delegation Virtual Pre-Inaugural Celebration. And now your host, Catherine Fleming Bruce. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Catherine Fleming Bruce. I'm the National Coalition Delegation Chair. And we were elected by our respective communities at the 2020 Democratic National Convention. We formed to bring delegates together, regardless of which presidential candidate they represented, so that we could engage in dialogue and cooperation. We support policies that bring hope and opportunity to people across the country. But tonight, we want to kick off Inauguration Week in a spirit of celebration, a spirit of confidence and a demeanor of courage. An old civil rights song says, ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. And we want to keep that commitment and that strength for what lies ahead this week and for the next 100 days. We are making history with this election year, from wrestling with a global pandemic to addressing issues of race and white supremacy. What we do next and how we succeed depends on what we bring to the table to sustain us for this journey. Our guest tonight will focus on the four priorities of President-elect Biden's new administration, COVID-19, racial equity, economic recovery, and climate change. And leading our celebration is our first guest, the Honorable Tony Goelho, who served as vice chair of the 2020 Democratic National Convention and has been involved in electoral politics for a number of years. He's going to walk us down the path from the convention in Milwaukee to the White House. Thank you, Tony. You have the floor. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that very much. I loved your words. The road from the 2020 Democratic Convention to the inauguration of Joe Biden as President of the United States and Kamala Harris as Vice President has been paved with historic firsts for our party and the nation. Democrats came together to prioritize health and safety for all during an unprecedented pandemic. As we worried and mourned, we also persevered and continued to fight for Americans and bring them back to hope, change, and joy. Each of you was a part of that steadfast determination. Thank you for your hard work and congratulations. We entered into a new phase in American political history during this cycle and developed new ways to connect through virtual platforms. The most significant starting point for this new virtual world was the 2020 Democratic National Convention. Originally planned to be in person in Milwaukee, we saw the first ever virtual convention of a major political party in history. This allowed more people to participate in a compelling way that increased representation at meetings by many different groups. As many of you know, I hail from the disability community and was the principal author of the Americans with Disabilities Act in Congress. So accessibility and my community's engagement are very important to me. This year's DNC saw disabled people from every Democratic Party constituency make accommodation requests and participate in meetings and events across the board, a first for us. Many people reported the convention as the most accessible ever. This fact also emphasizes the intersexuality of our party. Democrats are not a monolith. It was also never more evident on our history making choice for vice president. Kamala Harris will be the first ever black 
Asian American and woman vice president of the United States. As delegates, you had a huge part in placing the Carter's first landmark on the American landscape. We have a lot to be proud of coming out of the 2020 Democratic National Convention. In addition to nominating our candidates for the two highest offices in the land and passing our party's platform, the convention serves as a pep rally and training camp where delegates get ready to be leaders in their home communities for get out the vote efforts. From August, we launched into the general election campaign that acutely strategized the targeted battleground states, bringing in 80 million votes for Joe and Kamala. This is the highest number of votes any presidential ticket has ever received. Another history first for us. And it signifies that the Democrats are on the right track for engaging voters and towards building a new national majority. The election results brought in an electoral college victory we celebrate at the inauguration this week. A victory had to be defended in recent days, as all of you know, which makes our win even more important for maintaining the most significant elements of civil democracy and demonstrate to future generations that the continuation of elected leadership by the will of the people is the North Star that guides America. I'm very excited for Joe and Carmela to be sworn in to office this week. We, Dem we Democratic Party organizers should also be very proud that we delivered them a Congress that they can work with, holding a majority in both houses. That was not easy. The Georgia were runoff and the role of grassroots leader in it was very, very significant. Democrats showed, that the, na showed the nation that we are ready for action when we turned on a dime, as they say, to engage in voters and bring in a Senate majority and the first ever African-American and Jewish senators from Georgia. There we go again, making history again. The only, the other reason that I'm excited is that President Biden, Vice President Harris, and leaders in the Congress are the right people to begin addressing the hurt from the past four years and start us on the road to healing. We have to stop the hate before it gets worse and turn it back. Joe and Kamala can, can do it, but they can't do it alone. They need each and every one of you to help them. By being the party in power, we are also charged with great responsibility. We must work to get our country healed from the pain of COVID-19 and the soreness in many hearts from the mar marginalization and antagonization of those who have lost their focus on what democracy is all about. With all that, we have accomplished this past year. Okay. Well, I have faith that we can do it under now, Joe uh, and Kamala's and Nancy and Chuck's leadership. Yeah. In closing, I want to say that I couldn't be more proud of the Democratic delegates. Congratulations for your victories. And remember that Wednesday doesn't just belong to the winning candidates. It's your day too, so celebrate. Now it is my pleasure to introduce John Bella, who will discuss COVID-19. Take it away, John. So, my name is John Bala. I am part of the North Carolina delegation, um, a state that, among other things, includes the uh, okay. Research Triangle Park. We need bread. And um, I got to tell you, among other things, we are so happy to see a return to a respect for science. Um, like so much that happened during 2020, the delegates to the Democratic National Convention came together virtually. Uh, we conducted the serious business of nominating our candidate, and we also created actions that are the makings of community. And we came together as a community of delegates. Uh, communities are the threads that make the thread, make up the strength of America. And it's no coincidence that the Democratic Party has a platform that's people-centric. Um, the four priorities of the Biden-Harris transition represent some of the most important ways that the Democratic platform can have the biggest impacts on everyday people. And after the last four years, it seems like everything is a priority. But COVID-19, racial equity, the economic recovery, and climate change are where the transition of focus, and it's also where we've yeah, now recognized our Brad, program tonight. Brock Bank is next. So our goal really was to strike a positive tone. We 
don't want to be disrespectful to the tragedy that COVID-19 has wreaked on the world and certainly the loss that many families have suffered. Um, but we want to kick the inauguration week off with a note of celebration because really it's a dawning of a new day in America. Um, the inauguration of uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris represent a triumph for many of uh, uh, the people across America that have worked very hard, certainly in the state of Georgia and many other places, to achieve uh, new um, new things and, and certainly to bring in a new administration. So in any case, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker on COVID-19, um, Bradley Brocklebank, Brockbank, excuse me, who is elected in Colorado as an at-large delegate for Joe Biden uh, to the 2020 uh, Democratic National Convention. Okay. He's been a consultant in healthcare policy and business strategy and for the past 12 that, years at and... Segway Consulting. He's worked with nonprofit organizations, foundations, government agencies, and private sector employees. Next? He's currently the chair of well, health just tell, policy just tell John study. To keep talking. Uh, the Health Policy Study Group for the Democratic Party of Denver mm -hmm. and the party's finance chair in Colorado's House Committee, too. He's built and directed intellectual property and technology commercialization program at National Jewish Health, and he served as a policy advisor and speechwriter for then Governor Roy Romer of Colorado, as well as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Energy and the EPA. On January 1st of this year, he founded the Alliance for Community and Regional Healthcare Solutions to research, validate, and replicate locally led and negotiated solutions to healthcare affordability and quality issues. The nonprofit organization Peak Health Alliance, which Brad's partner at Segway helped to create and now leads, provides one model of this approach. And in just two years, Peak mobilized employers and local governments in seven Colorado counties and negotiated directly with hospitals, other providers, and insurers to reduce premiums for member employees and individual health insurance purchasers in those counties by 35%, while also improving and expanding access to mental health and primary care. He earned a master's degree in public policy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and he has a bachelor's degree in human biology from Stanford University. Um, suffice it to say, uh, Brad has an informed uh, perspective on healthcare and certainly uh, we, it's an honor to bring him to tonight's program. And uh, go ahead, Brad. And uh, he's prepared some great uh, uh, perspectives for us. Thank you. Hi, welcome everybody. I hope you can hear me. I wanna thank you, Catherine, and the rest of the National Delegate Coalition for giving me a chance to share some reflections and preview of the Biden-Harris administration's current plans to end the COVID pandemic and build back better uh, I, I'm sort of describing my remarks as truth, trust, and leadership. And first things first, I want to reference uh, Andy Slavitt. Some of you may know he's, just, he's been appointed to be a senior advisor to the Biden administration's COVID-19 response team and was the former administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services under President Obama. And he said on Twitter the other day, which he's very active on, he said, I've been asked one question over and over by the press, states, hospitals, and others. What's the first thing you expect to be different with Biden as president? And his answer, Andy's answer was my answer, getting the truth. And a quote from, a recent quote from President-elect Biden is, the honest truth is this, things will get worse before they get better. And the policy changes we're going to be making, they're gonna take time to show up in the COVID statistics. But truth in my mind is one of the important things of restoring trust. And another thing that's restoring trust, I think, and I'm very excited about to see is the people that he's brought to bear on this problem. His chief medical advisor, he's keeping Dr. Anthony Fauci at the forefront, one of the most trusted people and voices in our country on this crisis. As uh, the COVID equity task force chair and the co-chair of the entire COVID task force is Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith, who was the founding director of Yale University's Equity Research and Innovation Center. I think that's fantastic. The White House Chief of Staff is Ron Klain, who led the response to the Ebola epidemic. The coordinator of the COVID-19 response overall is Jeff Zentz, who led the 2013 tech surge to revitalize the healthcare.gov website that had its problems. And finally, the CDC director, 
Dr. Rochelle Walensky is a respected expert on the value of testing and treatment of deadly viruses, such as HIV and AIDS. And Joe Biden has said just yesterday, equity is central to our COVID response. But leadership is not a position, it's not a title, it's not authority, leadership is an act. And the Biden and Harris administration's national action plan on COVID-19, I wanna summarize four major points. The week one executive orders that are expected, expanded testing and tracing, accelerated vaccine deployment, and economic relief and recovery. This is all great, but Congress must also act. The incoming administration has proposed a $1.9 trillion relief bill that includes over $400 billion for COVID-19 response. None of the things I'm going to talk quickly about here in the next minute or two will happen without Congress acting and acting and showing leadership. The executive orders, day one, a mask mandate for federal properties and interstate travel, extending the pause on student loan payments, actions and actions to prevent evictions and foreclosures. Day two, an executive order on expanding virus testing, and on the reopening of schools and businesses. And on day three, economic relief for those suffering economic costs from the pandemic. About testing and tracing, the proposed relief bill calls for $50 billion to expand testing to help schools reopen, to protect vulnerable places like prisons and nursing homes, and to ensure that any American who can get a test for free when they need one. Whether they're going to be buying more rapid tests, they're going to be expanding lab capacity, and they're going to be supporting local governments and schools. They're going to be hiring 100,000 public health workers to provide testing, tracing, and vaccine outreach support. And as the pandemic winds down, and it will wind down, they may, those people may transition to a longer public health role to improve the quality of care and reduce hospitalization for low-income and underserved communities. They want to accelerate vaccine deployment with a $20 billion vaccine program to get 100 million vaccine shots into the arms of Americans in the first 100 days of the administration. They want to ramp up the vaccination process in pharmacies. They want to build mo mobile vaccine clinics to get vaccine to hard to reach and underserved rural and urban communities. They're calling for states to expand vaccine eligibility groups to people 65 and older. They want to make programs available for high risk settings, including homeless shelters and jails and institutions that serve in individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And they will employ the Defense Production Act if necessary to get this done. And finally, for economic relief and recovery, $1 trillion in direct relief to families, increasing the stimulus payments by $1,400 to a total of $2,000. 440 billion for aid to communities and businesses, including 350 billion in emergency funding to state, local and tribal governments. Emergency paid leave to 106 million workers and eliminating exemptions for employers with less than 50 employees and more than 500 employees. And finally, 107, 170 billion for K-12 schools along with colleges and universities so they can develop and implement plans to safely reopen like reducing classroom size and improving ventilation and supporting remote learning. The goal is to reopen the majority of K-8 schools within the first 100 days. So that's just a brief summary of what we're all looking forward to. And on a personal note, it's really important to me. The last couple of days, I've been speaking with my siblings to talk about my 97-year-old father who we may have to send into hospice in the next few days. We're not sure we're gonna be able to see him. The COVID pandemic is personal to me and it's personal to a lot of you. And I'm very hopeful that the next days to come will be much better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine Fleming Bruce, for putting together this diverse group of people who care about democracy, love our country, and have the respect of our communities enough to be voted as delegates. I'm honored to be with this group of delegates, which is racially, racially diverse, as well as diverse with respect to sexual orientation, disabilities, religious backgrounds, and other backgrounds. The delegates reflect the party, and the party reflects the nation. President-elect Biden put together a detailed plan with programs to address racial equity, showing his commitment to long-term positive change. His commitment is additionally addressed with his selection of leaders to help accomplish the goals. I learned from the pro-Israel communities that pro-Israel doesn't mean anti-anybody else. It simply means...
means that Israel has the right to exist in peace, to be given respect and autonomy of other U.S. allies. Israel, like other U.S. allies, has fair elections in which every citizen, including Arabs, has the ability to vote. Women, people of color, sexual orientation have equal rights. There are courts and laws with similar values to our own. When there's a global emergency, Israel steps in to help despite its small size. Pro-Israel means having the right to exist in peace and to be given the same respect as other U.S. allies. Similarly, racial programs which help Black, Latino, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native Americans aren't anti-anybody. They are well thought out programs to help our communities or to help their communities as well thrive economically and otherwise. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also learned from pro-Israel community. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? I also learned from pro-Israel communities that some issues are deep. If you look at the surface of the BLM protests without looking deep, one might see innocent people killed or innocent bystander store owners have damage or super spreader COVID events. However, if you look deeper, you see frustrated people due to systematic police brutality and generation of gen after generation of groups not being given the opportunities to be entrepreneurs, to be homeowners, to control their own destinies and to thrive. The well thought out racial equity programs address these issues for long term positive gain. Similarly, and how I learned from my perspective, when people looking at Israel want to change the political structure of Judea and Samaria, Samaria, also known as the West Bank, one may see them as taking land away from somebody else. You could instead look a little deeper and see that it's undeveloped desert land, and when you dig, you only find Jewish artifacts and nobody else's. So... With, when a country like Israel has values similar to our, excuse me, has similar values to our own, it, we have to trust that it has the knowledge to protect its own people, and it might need the land to protect its citizens from deadly surprise terrorist attacks. It might need the land to protect its water supply from being diverted or contaminated, or it might need it for affordable housing for those wanting to live close to Jerusalem. Similarly, by having programs which enable Black, Latino, Asian American, and Pacific Islanders, and Native Americans to thrive, it empowers the citizens to make long-term positive change to control their own destinies. I can't wait to hear the words from Don Politi, PhD candidate from the University of South Carolina, from Dr. Melissa Del Vivas from the University of South Carolina, Yvette Joseph, MSW, and member of the Colville Confederated Tribes from Spokane, delegate representing the state of Washington, and Salima Lovelace, the delegate representing the state of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Catherine Fleming Bruce, for the opportunity to be part of this amazing delegate group, and I look forward to the future events. Good evening to everyone. My name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I am a recently elected district attorney in Georgia. I hope that you can hear me. There's a little delay on my end. I am sorry for that. But I am here to speak to you about racial equity and what the promises are from our Biden and Harris administration. First of all, let me just thank the National Coalition Delegation for inviting me here to speak on this topic and to address all of you. Congratulations on being delegates. I was not a delegate, but I did have the honor of being one of the 16 electors in Georgia, where for the first time we were able to vote Democrat for President Biden and Vice President Harris since 1992, and it was quite an honor to put in that vote. Representation matters so much, especially right now, especially in these very difficult and tumultuous times. You know, we come from a spring and a summer where there was so much in terms of uncertainty and in terms of righteous rage over racial tensions and over injustice. I ran on a progressive prosecution platform because I understood what our community was going through and that without justice truly, 
there cannot be peace or the sense that this country is, in fact, for every single person that is there. And so now, here we are. After those incredible images that we all witnessed last week happening at the Capitol. But what we have to look forward to in this week is a future of hope, but a future that also means we have a lot of work to do. And I know that this new Biden-Harris administration, you know what? They're not afraid of doing that work. And when they look at equity, they understand that equity doesn't just mean the social justice that we need to have, but at the very basis of it, it means to make sure that everyone has access to economic prosperity and opportunity. And when you look at the Biden agenda, what you see is that it is built on this proposition that we must build our economy back better than it was before the COVID crisis, but making sure that we are inclusive in that way. He lays out his vision for a stronger, resilient, and most importantly, an inclusive economy. As we look at COVID and the way that it has hit minority populations, we understand that equity means so much more than just doing things equally across the board. And so it is important that all of us are able, every single American, to enjoy a fair return for the work that we do and an equal chance to get ahead, to reach that American dream. You know, I believe Biden and Harris, when they talk about having a more vibrant and more powerful economy and country because it is inclusive in that way. And so I am happy to be here talking with each of you about this plan. One of the reasons is because I am the first Latina DA in the entire history of Georgia. And in one way, when you look at that in 2020 and 2021, and you say, how can that be after all this time? And our own Kamala Harris is the first African-American and Asian and woman vice president. And again, we ask ourselves in 2020 and 2021, how can that be? Why after so much time? And, you know, with every announcement that they make about their cabinet, I stand prouder and prouder of President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris because it shows a cabinet that truly is the face of America. Thank you, and I hope you have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate and we're so proud to host the first Latina um, district attorney in the state of Georgia. And we realize that Georgia has been at the forefront of everyone's attention for um, the last month. So we're so very proud of Georgia, of the organizations like Black Voters Matter, um, New Georgia Project, uh, Fair Fight, and others that have been a part of bringing that victory um, to the front. So um, I now want to welcome DJ Polite and Melissa uh, DeVelvez. Um, the two of them are at the University of South Carolina, but are also recent article um, authors with the Washington Post. So we're very excited to uh, hear from the two of them. And I think we'll start with DJ. So again, I want to thank everybody here for inviting me here tonight. You know, I'm just really excited to talk with you all. Like I said, I am a PhD candidate from the University of South Carolina. And in that article, I really just thought about in the last couple of days, really just talk about 1876 and the talk of a stolen election and the talk of many, in many ways, trying to invalidate black voters to try and invalidate that they are active members of democracy and in many ways try to illegitimize that they have choice. And I think with the victory of Joe Biden, 
what we have come to see, especially in states like Georgia with him winning in Georgia and the two Senate races that were won in Georgia, is that the South is not really as conservative as people have portrayed to be a disfranchised area, a disfranchised region, specifically for Black voters. And if we are going to continue to see progress within Congress, within Washington, within democracy itself, I think, you know, I'm excited about the possibilities of perhaps starting with a John Lewis Voting Rights Act, really empowering local leaders, local activists to day in and day out and to lift them up to a national level to show that the South is not this region that people would like to make it out to be, that there are many and many of Stacey Abrams out there just doing the work that just need the help to lift them up and show what democracy can really be, especially for the South, especially for Black voters that aren't in the urban centers of the North in the Midwest. Because as Outcast loves to say, and I love Outcast, is the South got something to say. And so I'm happy with the pick of Jamie Harrison for DNC. And I'm excited about the possibilities moving forward if we choose to make that a reality. But I do want to bring in my, my good friend, Dr. Develvis here. You know, she's an incredibly thoughtful partner in a lot of this work. But my name is uh, Dr. Melissa Develvis, and I'm uh, thrilled to be with you all here, especially as a resident of the great state of Georgia. Um, right on the edge by the uh, Savannah River. And it was wonderful to write this piece with the Washington Post with my dear friend and collaborator, uh, DJ Polite, whom you've heard of, heard from before. Um, he is a darling friend and also was on the ground from the primaries, is very involved in local community, and also is a scholar of reconstruction and Jim Crow in South Carolina specifically. And when we wrote this piece about voter fraud in 1876, um, and about how white Democrats that were formerly Confederate, and so the Democrats were the conservative branch, uh, we, we were just seeing so many instances of ballot stuffing in which they did more votes than there were people in states, and where they would guard voting booths um, from these with these red shirt militias to influence and intimidate people from voting unless they're voting in a certain way. And we were just really displeased to see all of these allegations of voter fraud when we study exclusively an election that had voter fraud that effectively disenfranchised Black people in South Carolina. And a lot of other states in the South kind of did this as well for until the civil rights movement. And we watched with horror as this piece enveloped even more. And then because when the governor race was tied in South Carolina and a group, a white mob came to the state house to get Wade Hampton, former Confederate general who had won based on ballot stuffing. They mobbed the Capitol to try and get him elected based on fraudulence. And so we really watched with horror as this happened. And that is essentially the crux of the piece that we wrote is kind of talking about 1876 and this long legacy of black voter disfranchisement in the South. And it took years of activism and hard work by Georgia voting organizations such as Fair Fight and uh, Georgia Votes Matter and things like this in order to see a change in Georgia from years and years of voter suppression. And one of the reasons why I think this happened and one of the reasons why I'm so excited to see pre future President Biden's um, addressing racial equity is that we have not dealt with the scars that elections like 1876 left on our communities. And I am so thrilled to see Dr. Jill Biden in the White House as well as she focuses on education, because with our last president, I was really upset to see this idea of a presidential commission on a 1776 commission on patriotic history in which you have to say something and teach something that is patriotic when frankly, the piece that DJ and I wrote might not pass that qualification because what I think we need is educators to focus on the history of the South, the roots of these tears in our communities that we still see. And it's only with a willingness to look at the issues in the US that we can move forward. And so I encourage and I am excited to see um, 
the Biden and Harris administration um, push towards racial equity. And I hope to see future uh, attempts by both them and Democrats on state levels to continue to push for voting rights uh, that have been walked back since the Voting Rights Act was walked back, and to also continue to push for an education that deals with these hard topics of race in America. Because if we don't, we will continue to see um, a Confederate flag inside of the Capitol, which I hope I never see again. So a hopeful ending, a hopeful looking forward that uh, once we learn this hard history, we can learn more about ourselves as Americans and be stronger as a nation. And I thank you for being here. And I thank you all for all of the work that you've done um, as this election cycle comes to a close. <laughs> thank you. So now I think we're ready to um, hear some of the wisdom from Yvette Joseph. And I thank you very much for joining us. It's a delight to join everyone here from across the country. I am a member of the Colville tribe from Washington State, and I was a delegate for Joe Biden. I've been really excited about his um, decision to prioritize uh, racial justice and to assemble a very diverse uh, cabinet that has now um, been announced. Um, he, he plans to tackle a lot of the pressing equity issues that are affecting uh, many of the communities of color. Um, we know that civil rights and policing and criminal justice are very needed. We know there are issues with um, COVID-19 and its impact on uh, racial communities. We're very familiar with um, many of the issues related to um, the disparities in the nation's uh, racial wealth. Um, there's not a lot of equity there. There's a gap. And there are issues, as we know, with voting rights and with um, many more uh, concerns possibly even related to education. So um, in Indian country, there's a scarcity of data about the criminal justice systems, but we know that native populations are overrepresented um, in the criminal justice system, according to most recent reports by the Department of Justice. In 2016, there were like 19,790 native men. There were 2,954 native women who were incarcerated in US and federal prisons. Um, this is not including state or local prisons. I mean, it includes state prisons, but not the local um, prison systems. And um, we know like places like North Dakota, which has a high um, number of Native American people, that Native people are seven times the population that are incarcerated in the state as compared to non-Natives. And it's just um, unfortunate, it impacts our youth as well. Youth, um, Native Americans under the age of 21 um, are uh, about 42% of the population in, across Indian country. Um, there are 255 per 100,000 um, youth that are, um, are a part of the criminal justice system. They're three times more likely to be con confined as compared to 83 per 100,000 amongst non-Native people. So it's a challenge in the justice system. It's a challenge in education. We know that for minority populations, black and other um, brown populations, that um, education is um, not equal, it's not just. We know that about two thirds of the students are still attending segregated schools. And we have to do more to ensure that there's caring, competent and qualified teachers. And so. We're very excited about Jill Biden and her emphasis in education. Um, and we really know, you know, we're not necessarily seeking equal treatment. We are just seeking um, equal educational opportunity. And that is something that the Biden administration will embrace. And we're looking very forward to that. And we're very, very excited about the fact that there will be increased attention around the um, coronavirus uh, 19. Um, there are uh, amongst the Navajo Nation, for instance, Navajo Nation was very important up to 97% of some of their precincts, up to 97% of many parts of their reservation in Arizona and New Mexico. The reservation is about the size of West Virginia, but they had um, many people voting um, essentially in honor of those who had died in their families um, from COVID. And they were voting uh, for Joe Biden because they see that Joe Biden is very sincere and plans to do something 
about the coronavirus. Um, this past week, there were at least 919 people um, who have died as of January um, um, 12th. And it's just one of those numbers that continues to grow. Um, they are always have been amongst Navajo people and other Native American communities of high propensity towards the flus and the influenza that affects our communities. So um, many people are really anxious to get the coronavirus vaccine and um, do something to sort of thwart that issue across Indian country. Um, so essentially, I just wanted to offer a few tidbits um, to say that, you know, it is very true that we're seeking, we're not necessarily seeking um, special treatment as much as we'd like to see racial equity and the economics um, behind Head Start, behind elementary schools, behind college education. And, you know, we're very much looking forward to the Biden administration. We know that he's going to make a significant difference in terms of affecting children and youth and, the, and their families. And, um, you know, uh, like the gentleman said before, I'm very excited as well that Jamie Harrison, someone that I've worked with, with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation on race, race, race and um, truth and transformation and, and healing, the healing of America, that that is uh, initiatives that, you know, we were working to address um, as recently as 2013. Um, and through 20, 2018. So I'm hopeful that we'll see more attention to this matter in the coming years, in the next four years. And so with that, I'm going to segue and turn to the speaker who follows. Her name is Salima Lovelace. Um, I've just met her over the Zoom meetings and planning for this event. She was a 2020 delegate and a, a delegate for Joe Biden from East Norrington in Pennsylvania. She's committed to transforming um, city government and she is an agent of change. So with that, I pass the baton on to Salima Lovelace. And um, just wanted to tell all of you across um, Indian country, as well as the United States, that we're very, very excited to, to welcome Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to the White House. It just couldn't come sooner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Catherine, for putting this um, event together and good evening. Um, Biden believes in economy um, that includes everybody. Color does not seem to be an issue for him when it comes to racial equity. As we all know, black and brown people in our community got really hit the most in the pandemic. Um, some lost jobs, homes as well. Part of Biden's plan is to ensure everyone a fair chance to outline in the Build Back Better plan with emphasis on black and brown community. This plan covers racial equity and equality. I am happy to see diversity, diversity excuse me, among Biden's cabinet that includes black, which means our voices will be heard as well. He won Pennsylvania and delivered a remarkable speech where I, where I had the honor to be a part of. The hearts, he won the hearts of the voters in Pennsylvania and I'm looking forward to more positivity and opportunities for our community. Thank you again, Catherine. Thank you for all the delegates that I had to meet across the board. And I look forward to January the 20th where we all move forward. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Salima, is, you're doing a wonderful job and she was actually supposed to head to um, DC and all of the things happening in there um, made her decide that it wasn't quite a safe um, place to be. So we are hopeful um, that the, um, the plan and the protocol happening there uh, is going to take care of everyone. So now we're going to bump over um, to Texas. We're gonna bump over to Texas to Coretta Graham and um, we look forward to hearing her introduction floor is yours, Coretta. Thank you, uh, Catherine Fleming Bruce, for your vision and your leadership. It is my honor to present our next uh, group of speakers on a very another important topic in the Biden-Harris administration, and that is the economy, something that is near and dear to my heart as a small business owner 
as well as a member of the newly formed Small Business Caucus of the Texas Democratic Party. And so we know with the Biden-Harris administration, um, they want to build an economy where every American is a part of how of what's going on, as they say, in on the deal. And they want to create an economy for all businesses to thrive and compete with the rest of the world because we are a global economy. And so hopefully our next speakers, which are, which are the Honorable Jermaine Johnson from the South Carolina House of Representatives was an Andrew Yang surrogate. And Ms. Tam Mrs. Tammy Browning Smith, attorney, who was a 2020 uh, delegate from Newcastle, Delaware. And so um, hopefully they will address what's in Biden's plan for the economy. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Uh, I want to say thank you all for having me on here. Um, you know, we're extremely excited to be in this moment. Uh, we have seen, you know, what's been going on in the United States, across the country, and quite frankly, across the world uh, right now uh, with, with the protests and the, the mob and, you know, the, the things that have been going on uh, with the, just the blatant lies that have happened. Uh, but we're excited now. We're excited because we're moving forward to a new beginning. Uh, and we're just happy to just to be involved with what we have going on here. Uh, like Catherine just said, you know, I am a new uh, representative uh, here in South Carolina, House District 80. Uh, and down here, we call it the new 80 because we're moving toward a new future uh, and a brand new beginning for everybody here. Um, you know, so I, I was uh, in the in the uh, the recent uh, past the South Carolina campaign chairman for uh, former presidential candidate Andrew Yang. Uh, now he is a, uh, a runner for the mayor of New York. Um, and some of the things that we talked about uh, while on his campaign trail was just the economic disparities of what's going on in America and how we can actually, you know, find solutions to solve some of these problems. So we talked about, you know, some of the things uh, such as uh, how can people pull themselves up by the bootstraps like Martin Luther King used to talk about when they don't have any bootstraps to pull themselves up by, you know, and we talked about this guaranteed uh, minimum uh, income uh, for, for people outside, uh, you know, uh, of these areas. So uh, we want to talk about things like that just to, to give people an opportunity just to have a starting point out here. Uh, we know that, you know, most people in America cannot afford an unexpected $400 bill. You know, that's where the guaranteed uh, minimum income came from. And that's some of the things that I'm trying to bring here to South Carolina. Uh, you know, I talked about uh, on the campaign trail, I, I talk a lot about my past, uh, my history, and where I come from. I was originally born in, in Los Angeles, California, back in the 80s. And everybody knows what happened in the 80s. It was, it was the crack epidemic. And with the crack epidemic, it, you know, it rages war through my family and through my neighborhood and through my community. Uh, so, we, you know, I grew up, I've been homeless, I went to seven different high schools. Uh, I, I've had a, uh, I had, you know, pretty much what a rough upbringing is. But, you know, my story is not unique to what people are going through. It's not, it, it, there's a lot of people in America that are going through the situations that I had to go through, which is why I decided to run for office, to make sure that anybody that was like me did not have to go through the things that I've been through in my life. And that was my inspiration to really change the future for future generations, uh, to help inspire upcoming individuals, uh, you know, to give them uh, some hope, to give them something that they can look forward to uh, that they can do in their lives, to be an example. And that's exactly what we talk about here. That's, uh, you know, a lot of the conversations that myself and Andrew have had, it was talking about what we want to do for America, what we want to do for people, and how we want to change some things. So, you know, we have to get back on track. And one of the things that I like that I'm seeing President uh, Bi President Elect Biden talking about is uh, you know giving that two thousand dollar check for people because we're going through a time right now when you know people are all, people have already been struggling, but now you know uh, people are struggling even more with this pandemic. So it's time to get things back on track. It's time to fix things, and I'm just happy to be here uh, because I know that we are moving in the right direction. Greetings from the very windy. C&D Canal here in Middletown, Delaware. 
Delaware is the first state and the proud home of our next president and first lady. My name is Tammy Browning Smith and I am a proud Delawarean and was honored to serve as a Biden BNC delegate. Delaware has served as the cornerstone of our state, the cornerstone state for our great democracy since 1787. It is no surprise that President-elect Biden chose the theme, Build Back Better, as he unites our great country. Delaware is honored to provide, once again, the cornerstone for another great building moment in this nation's rich history. According to the New York Times in February 2009, then Vice President Biden slid a memo across the table to President Biden proposing his role to spearhead the implementation of the Recovery Act of 2009. President Obama agreed, and we now know that thanks to Joe Biden's tireless leadership and efforts, our nation weathered the Great Recession and our economy was built back stronger and more diverse. This time in 2020, Joe Biden created a memo and slid it across the table to the American people, proposing a plan to heal the country and build back better. On November 3rd, 2020, our nation accepted his plan, the Build Back Better plan. A plan rich in investing locally while acting globally. A plan which builds people up and provides opportunities for those who dream. My husband, Dale, and I moved to Delaware. We read an article in the magazine Delaware Today that said one in three Delawareans have met Joe Biden. The longer we have been here in Delaware, the more we realize Delawareans have strong personal connections to the Bidens. Joe knows people and that it is people who will help us build back better. As an intellectual property attorney, I work extensively with those who create and innovate. I see firsthand the difference small creative businesses make to a local economy. It is no surprise that President-elect Biden knows that building back better can only be achieved when small businesses can create and innovate. I am an honored member of the Disability Caucus. Disabled Americans thrive, innovate, and contribute to their communities. Yet, opportunities for economic advancement are often overlooked. Not with Joe. Joe's platform included disabled Americans and understands that disabled Americans are a vital part of the U.S. economy. Members of the disability community have been advocating for years for a seat at the table to discuss our economic future. Joe not only gave us a seat at the table, he made us part of his plan of building back better. Delawareans throughout the campaign wore a button that says, I know Joe, and we sure do. We are honored to share President-elect Biden and Dr. Biden with our nation and the world. For Delaware, as the first state and a cornerstone in which our democracy is built, it is only fitting today that Delaware's favorite son be the one to create a set of firsts, a diverse representative government. And it is even more fitting that Delaware's own president-elect, Joe Biden, lay a strong cornerstone to help restore our economy and build back better as an America United. Let me begin and by thanking the everybody and Catherine Bruce in particular for organizing this um, event. Uh, we, like you all, are thrilled uh, with the change in administration and uh, the platform that's been put forward on the environment and particularly climate uh, issues. Um, what, what we've learned over the last four years certainly is that science matters, that regulations can be politicized, that there is disproportionate risk and environmental racism in our society, and that we must attack the um, climate crisis and also biodiversity decline that threatens life and then undue corporate influence uh, within 
the environment as well. And with Joe Biden, um, you know, as we hear him speak and read the policies that you all worked on, clearly what's emerging as uh, in the forefront is listening to the scientists, systemic change. Uh, we've heard about fossil fuels being phased out and a commitment to environmental justice. Um, now, systemic change is critical if we're talking about climate uh, and dealing with the environmental racism that uh, undergirds this whole problem. And what does that really mean? What are the fundamental changes that have to take place in terms of the whole system? It affects our economic system. It affects racial injustice. It affects health care and health uh, in our society. It affects our ecosystem. So ultimately, we'll be transforming the fundamental um, issues that are part of our daily lives. Um, this is good for the economy, but first and foremost, we have to recognize, as the UN has recognized, that agriculture is a key element um, in all of this, and that we can no longer continue to disrupt the microbial communities these are communities in the soil. These are communities of life that capture okay. Okay. carbon. Okay. Um, and they are that this is at the root of, of solving the problem. So what when I say environmental justice and how that factors in, we know there are frontline communities. We've experienced with COVID, um, the whole nation now is aware that there's disproportionately high risk among people of color. Um, that those risk factors are exacerbated by respiratory immune system neurological problems uh, farm workers and landscapers are disproportionately people of color and so with this administration we're going to see the need to focus in on these chemicals that get out into the environment pesticides among them toxic chemicals uh, uh, petroleum-based materials uh, have to elevate our protection of children and protection of the ecosystem, pollinators. And we do that through advancing uh, organic systems. Now, we've learned over these last few years that um, we, we have not taken care of these problems. And we also haven't been doing a very good job of working with Congress. So the White House and Congress hasn't be, been moving. So hats off to Georgia for um, helping uh, move a Democratic majority. So the president, President Biden, will have an opportunity to work on issues like the Agricultural Resilience Act, which will achieve net zero carbon emissions and remove additional carbon dioxide uh, from the environment. Um, Saving America's Pollinators Act, protect America's children from toxic pesticides, ban toxic pesticides, and uh, ultimately, we also need to uh, pass the Justice for Black Farmers Act, which will assist farmers in um, generating land, access to land, and create a civil rights board at USDA. As you all know, uh, Shirley Sherrod was summarily dismissed by, um, by Mr. Vilsack, uh, Tom Vilsack, who will be Bring, bring, being brought back to that position at, as the Secretary of Agriculture. And we have to work hard to change the culture at USDA to ensure that those ha who have not benefited from the system and are at highest risk are heard, voices are heard within that system. Um, we believe we will solve this problem. We can solve this problem. We can capture carbon, atmospheric carbon. We can mitigate climate change. We can protect against environmental racism, and we can do this through regenerative uh, agricultural systems that improve soil quality, minimize energy use, uh, minimize water pollution, minimize pesticide residues, and reduce worker uh, exposure to these chemicals and improve the ecosystem and ecosystem services. This is going to take work. And I know all the work that the delegates did to get us to this point to put together a platform. Now the hard work begins to rally the Congress, to get pieces of legislation passed, to get the resources, uh, to get all the voices at the table so that we no longer 
live with under this cloud of uh, environmental racism and environmental injustice and solve these problems. So hats off to all of you for the hard work that you're doing and have done and are committed to doing moving forward. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Bakar Kanu, um, Associate Professor at the University of North Carolina System and the 2020 North Carolina Congressional District 10 National Delegate. Um, our climate actually virtually influences everything around us from the day's weather to significant storms, from crop success to human health and so on and so forth. So in this slide, I want to introduce our next speakers, oh, which are um, Onlika Andrade and uh, Miguel Madrigal. So first of all, we'll go to Onlika and then followed by Miguel. Evening, everyone, and thank you, Catherine, for organizing this great event. Uh, all of us as delegates, we had a bit of a bizarre uh, convention, all online, and also we will have an online inauguration. So it's very nice to have be able to celebrate and come together. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Monelli Candrade. I was one of the 13 pledged delegates of Democrats Abroad. I actually live in Belgium, as you can see, and I vote in California. Uh, I don't have to remind you about the seriousness of climate change. My home state of California has been ravaged by fires in the past few years, and this last season was the worst season, and I'm scared that the next year we're gonna have yet the worst season. Uh, the urgency to act, is everywhere. Even the UN published a report on Thursday where they, the headline of the report was, you know, either you take climate action, action seriously or you will face serious damage. So when we start seeing international bodies already using this language, using this urgency to act, it means that, that, that really, really, we need to act. Things are getting very serious. And I think that the good part of this is that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be taking the presidency and vice presidency in three days. You know, in no time we'll have them. And I cannot wait to start seeing the US take a leading role when it comes to climate action. Many of us abroad working on climate change like me have seen the impact of not having the US as part of the Paris Agreement and as part of many other efforts on climate. Um, I know some remarkable work has taken place at the state level, at the city level, also the Democratic Party level. I know Michelle Dietrich, who's one of our speakers, and her team in the DNC Council on the Environment and Climate Crisis have done a whole lot to push the party to be ambitious and to take bold actions when it comes to climate and environmental issues. And I'm very sure that we will soon see a whole lot more of climate action the moment Biden and Harris take the White House. And the greatest part of all, and that uh, many uh, of the previous speakers have mentioned, is that we will have not only a blue house, we will have a blue Senate. So this is a great opportunity to make durable changes when it comes to climate policy, but not only climate policy, as the speaker before me was explaining, it's not only climate, it's health, it's race, it all comes together. We need systemic change. and. Biden Harris understand this, and they'll be able to pass policies that are more durable than just an executive order. And this is super exciting. And I just want to circle back. As I mentioned, I am a delegate from Democrats Abroad, and Miguel, who will be speaking right after me, is also a delegate from Democrats Abroad. And I want to talk a little bit about what Democrats is Abroad is about, because some of you may not have heard of us before, or are a bit unsure about this. So just to give you a bit of a flavor, uh, the State Department says that there are 9 million Americans abroad, like me, and 6.5 million are able to vote, to vote 6.5. So that makes us the 12th most populous state. You know, 6.5 is more than the population of Wisconsin and Arizona combined. And the thing is we vote in all 56 states and territories. In my case, I vote in California, but you'll see later on, Miguel votes in Ohio, and we have people that vote all over the country. Uh, 
And Democrats Abroad is the largest organization of civilian Americans outside of the United States. We're 100% volunteer run. So from the executive committee to our, all our caucuses, to our country committees, is we're all volunteers. We're in 45 countries across six continents. And we have members in 197 countries who vote in every congressional district in each US state and DC. What does Democrats Abroad do? You know, beyond sending delegates to the convention, we provide help to voters abroad. We have a platform called votefromabroad.org where we provide online voter support. We help voters that are abroad, Americans that are abroad, to register to vote, to request their ballots. We send voter prompts through calls, emails, and social media. We remind people that they need to register to vote, that they need to send back their ballots, and we help them as well. And we give voters access to elected officials through webinars. The latest webinar we had, the latest interview we had was with Deborah Gonzalez, who was speaking earlier today. And we advocate for overseas American issues, such as immigration citizenship rights, voting rights, banking and taxation issues. And I should highlight in this, you know, Americans abroad are not millionaires or tax evaders. Are, it's just people like me, and you see me get later, that for professional personal reasons are abroad. But we're not uh, on, a, on a luxurious house. We're just normal people trying to you know, work every day. And we care deeply and dearly about our country. And this is why we're so engaged. And we want others to be engaged. We are all over the world. And in my case, as I mentioned before, I work in California. And some of the issues we face when we're abroad is that some people don't know that they can vote. And then the second issue is sending our ballots back to our uh, home states. I am kind of lucky that I can actually vote and send my ballot not only by postal mail, but I can also send it by fax. And yes, who has a fax these days? Uh, but there's a lot of app applications on your mobile phones that can help you send your ballot back. And you know this accelerates the process and it means that I don't have to be sending back my ballot a month before because of all kinds of delays that might be with a US postal service or with a postal service. But you know this is just to illustrate that we all have the right to vote, but we all face a lot of difficulties when we're abroad. And we all each state has different ways of voting and i think earlier we were talking about voter suppression and you know as americans abroad we face a lot of voter suppression when it comes to because we are the original voters by mail and you know postal mail sometimes other postal services don't work or sometimes the registrations and the people registering us don't understand the status that we still we you have the right to vote and we will have that right even if we're not in the u.s so just to illustrate a bit of what we do and a bit of my experience voting in California, which is by fax, and I give it now to Miguel, who will talk to you a bit more about his own experience voting from abroad and some of the great work he did recently in Georgia. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Miguel Madrigal. I am an Ohio voter. I Actually, I was one, uh, along with Onelica, I was one of Biden's uh, four pledged delegates to attend the Democratic National Convention this year. Um, one of the things you might not know about Democrats abroad is that we have a, a wide uh, a network to help people vote. Uh, we have a website called votefromabroad.org, and we help uh, this, this past year a lot of people to vote voting from abroad. Nearly in 2020, two million ballots were cast from abroad, and 2020 was the largest, most sustained operation turnout in for U.S. citizens abroad in history. So two million ballots—that's almost uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, margin of victory. In 26, uh, in popular vote in 2016. So, and besides, 48% uh, of U.S. citizens living abroad vote in battleground states. So imagine the power U.S. citizens living abroad actually have. It's really important. Um, 
we, we stay engaged, and we motivate people from abroad to vote. We send votes home to every important race, every election year, to every single state. When U.S. citizens vote from abroad vote, Democrats win back home. And, you know, this was more, uh, this is very true in 2020. One out of 25 races across the United States came down to a 1% margin. We, Democrats abroad, are the margin of victory for the very, very tight races, especially last year. Uh, Arizona, Wisconsin, and Georgia, the, the margin of victory of those three states came from votes from abroad. So it's really important we keep um, helping uh, U.S. citizens voting abroad and informing them how they can vote. I vote in the state of Ohio. Unfortunately, I can only vote by, by postal mail, but there are so many other options. For example, the state of Indiana, you can vote via uh, uh, email. So, so um, thankfully, some states have been, have been modernizing their, their systems and states have not. So we should work forward and make sure every U.S. citizen that lives abroad has a, a fair shot to uh, vote from abroad. Now, this year, as Anetica mentioned, I, uh, I went to Georgia. I went to Georgia and I canvassed. I canvassed for Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. And it was an amazing experience going there, knocking on doors, getting to know the people of Georgia. And you know, many of them feel their voices haven't been heard by Kelly Leffler and David Perdue. And you know, I could feel their pain. I could feel Georgia was not in a good situation. And they want change. And change came to not only Georgia, but the entire United States. As Anelika mentioned, we will have a Democratic Senate starting uh, January 20th. So um, you know, that now is the time where we can start you know, moving Biden's agenda forward. And thanks to people like us, the delegates, the, the party's base, we managed to win back the White House, we maintained the Senate, and we won, and, and we won uh, the House. So it's, it's really important we stay engaged with the democratic process and we win, you know, we maintain control of both houses in 2022. Um, you know, with, with, uh, I, I canvassed with this organization called Mi Gente and we, you know, I, I was knocking a, a, about a, a 80 doors per day, uh, talking to people, letting them know the Democrats are there for them and they want to, the, uh, they want, uh, to promote free healthcare, uh, good quality education. These are, these are things people want, right? So, so uh, I'm so happy to have helped uh, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff uh, this past month in Georgia. And I want to thank you know, everybody from the Democratic Party. We did this. We were the ones who made this possible. So um, just, just a matter of, as a conclusion, I'd like to thank everybody for actually you know, being engaged in the Democratic process. And being uh, an active citizen and doing our 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 uh, um, you know our duty as citizens to vote, right? And making sure everybody else gets the right to vote. Uh, so if you have friends or family living abroad, please tell them to follow Democrats Abroad on social media. Uh, you can find us on on Facebook as Democrats Abroad, and on Twitter and on Instagram at at Dems Abroad. That's at Dems Abroad on uh, Twitter and Facebook. So I thank you very much for this, this, this little window we had to, to explain what Democrats Abroad is. Uh, and um, back to you, thank you. Thank you so much to Miguel and Onelica for um, talking to us all the way across the, uh, the, the water, as they say. Um, I don't even want to imagine what time it must be where they are. <laughs> But uh, they're they're doing a wonderful job, and I want to thank them. And now we have the opportunity to hear from a member of the DNC, um, that's the uh, Democratic National Committee. And Michelle Dietrich uh, is the founder and chair of the DNC Council on the Environment and Climate Crisis. So we are very pleased to have her here um to reflect on um the president-elect's agenda and michelle the floor is yours good evening it is such an incredible honor to be here 
listening to some of the people who have worked hardest to bring about the historic transition that we are making in just three days. Um, like Onlika and Yale of Dems Abroad. Um, Dems Abroad does such pivotal work getting out the vote every single cycle. Um, and also thank you so much to the National Coalition Delegation and to Catherine Fleming Bruce for bringing us together for this important event. I'm Michelle Regalado Dietrich. I am the founder and elected chair of the DNC Council on the Environment and Climate Crisis. Um, I also served in 2016 and 2020 as a national convention delegate and served on the platform committee in 2020, fighting for key platform changes on climate. And through these roles, I have become keenly aware of the incredible work that millions of Democrats have done to make this moment possible. Um, I love that this event is called a celebration. It is our celebration. But in the midst of the celebration, we know we are facing incredible challenges in this country and globally. The latest science shows that climate change is accelerating more rapidly than we thought even a year ago. We don't have another year or a month or even a day to waste. The inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris with their bold, ambitious environmental justice and climate agenda, the boldest and most ambitious ever for a US president, could not be happening at a more important moment. They and their team are faced with cleaning up four years of nearly immeasurable damage by Trump and the Republicans, and then taking the bold science-based actions so desperately needed. Joe Biden ran on climate, and there is a clear mandate from voters across the United States and Dems abroad to move forward through both executive actions and legislation. And I am inspired that the new administration is poised to rejoin the Paris Agreement on day one, and by the breaking news this evening that the Keystone Pipeline permits will be rescinded. There are clear indications of the kind these are clear indications of the kind of bold assertive action to reduce emissions, move to clean renewable energy, and rejoin the global movement to fight climate change that we can expect on day one in the first 10 day blitz of executive actions that are planned and in the first 100 days and beyond. The president elect selection of his climate team further demonstrates his commitment to bold climate action. Um, there are so many great appointments. I can only mention a few, um, but he appointed Gina McCarthy, former EPA administrator under President Obama, and more recently director of the National Resource Defense Council to head up the new first ever White House Office of Climate Policy. She is backed up by an all-star staff. He has nominated many other climate leaders. Uh, for example, Senator Deb Holland, a co-sponsor of the Green New Deal, and one of the first two Native Americans to serve in the US Senate. She will be leading uh, Interior, and there's also former Michigan governor from my own state, uh, so I wanna mention her, Jennifer Granholm, to lead Energy Department. The president and his team, recognizing that everything affects climate and climate affects everything, is launching a whole government response to the climate and environmental justice crisis, integrating action into transportation, foreign policy, and treasury and more. He is committed to ambitious national emissions targets, putting us on the path to net zero emissions no later than 2050 and to new, more ambitious targets under the Paris Agreement. And he has made environmental justice a priority, recognizing, um, as Jay said earlier, that black, brown, indigenous, and less resourced communities bear the brunt of climate change. He is committed to spending 40% of federal climate dollars in these communities. It's good news that when you stand up as Joe Biden does and as the Democratic Party does for millions of good new green union jobs, when you talk about fighting the climate crisis and environmental justice, you can do that with the confidence that the vast majority of Americans are supportive of what you're talking about. And doing this, you can build up the Democratic Party everywhere and anywhere. But we can't be fooled by what the Biden administration and allies in Congress will face, which is near universal obstruction for Republicans who still have a lot of power in the Senate. We won Georgia, but it's a very slim margin. We will also be facing disinformation and climate denialism continuing from the right wing. And that's where all of us come in. 
We need to have the backs of our allies in the Biden-Harris administration and in Congress and drum up public demand for bold climate action. That's why I worked with the DNC to create the DNC Council on the Environment Climate Crisis, which is just over a year old. It's why we're organizing in states across the country and supporting establishment of Democratic Party environmental caucuses in every state and territory. There are 41 that don't have one. We wanna make sure this issue is at the forefront of the agenda at every level of government. Um, and uh, you can follow us at www.dncclimate.org. All of us need to make sure um, that those who are standing in the way of the bold solutions that we need to save our planet are held accountable. Um, so this is all our fight. Let's celebrate and then let's get to work. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Michelle. And we have had a whirlwind uh, time today. We have had speakers from around the country. We have had uh, speakers from other parts of the world. And all of this is made possible by the people in this room and other people who assisted us in this process. So I wanted to thank um, WF Media for the fine work that they've done and the studio space and helping us put together something that is really sharp. I uh, want to thank uh, Lingua B, uh, the translators. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Um, and we had two translators this evening and they really did a wonderful job. Uh, certainly my first time uh, working with translators. I'm always watching the programs that you see the translators on. So I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing and I thank you. Um, I also want to thank our host committee. We had 30 members um, from around the country to uh, contribute, to uh, speak tonight, uh, to provide ideas to uh, as we were putting this event together. So I wanna thank everyone on the host committee and they did get um, a, a shout out with the great picture collage at the beginning. So I thank all of you. And I also want to thank the people who joined the National Coalition delegation uh, when we first started a little bit before the convention. So it was an unusual convention and we uh, had unusual responses to it, one of which is this coalition. So um, please visit our page on Facebook. Um, you're already here, but please spread the word um, to those who are not aware. And we're also on Twitter, uh, at 2 Delegation. So follow us on Twitter and also visit us on Facebook. And finally, I wanted to um, give you all an update on the rest of the inaugural events that are happening this week. So um, today, uh, were the Sunday events. Tomorrow on Monday is a National Day of Service. So this is an all-day uh, event and people around the country are um, doing whatever they can to focus on alleviating the impacts of the pandemic, hunger, poverty, uh, addressing homelessness and mental health and other issues. Um, Tuesday is the National COVID Memorial. That's going to be uh, 530 um, PM and you'll probably be able to see it on C-SPAN and other networks. And there's going to be a ceremony at the Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool, um, capturing the memory of the almost 400,000 people who have died from COVID. On Wednesday, there will be a field of flags at the national mall. Um, and of course, a lot of that has been closed now. So we're not sure, um, if they're going to do that. But of course, the swearing in ceremonies of the president elect Biden and vice president elect uh, Kamala Harris are going to take place at 1130 uh, a.m. So uh, please tune into all of that. And I don't want to leave tonight without thanking again all of the people who said yes to us um, and were a part of this event. So the Honorable Tony Coelho vice chair of the 2020 Democratic National Convention. Um, John Bala, who is a 
delegate and a member of our host committee, but also um, did so much to uh, help me put this together. Uh, Bradley Ross Brockbank, principal of Segway Consulting, also a delegate and founder of the Alliance for Community and Regional Healthcare Solutions. Um, the Honorable Deborah Gonzalez, District Attorney, State of Georgia. Uh, Michelle Miller, uh, delegate from 4th Congressional District of California. Don Polite and Dr. Melissa DeVelvis, um, co-authors of the Washington Post article uh, in the Made by History series. And uh, I, I want to be sure to say Made by History. Um, they're also on Facebook. You can follow them. Um, university, and they're both at the University of South Carolina. Uh, Yvette Joseph, who is a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes of Spokane, and was also a delegate of the from the 5th Congressional District in Washington. Uh, Salima Lovelace, 2020 delegate uh, from Pennsylvania. Uh, Coretta Graham, who was a 2020 PLO delegate from Texas. And for those who don't know what PLO is, that's um, pledged uh, leaders and elected officials. Uh, with the Democratic Party. Um, the Honorable Dr. Jermaine Johnson, South Carolina House of Representatives, and uh, also Tammy Bronick smith Esquire, delegate from Delaware. Dr. A. Bakar Kanu, uh, 2020 delegate from the 10th Congressional District of North Carolina. Uh, Jay Feldman, Executive Director of Beyond Pesticides. Uh, Onelica Andrade and Miguel Madrigo. Um, delegates representing Democrats abroad. And our last speaker was Michelle Dietrich, founder and chair of the DNC Council on the Environment and Climate Crisis. So, Before you close, someone will be coming to say something. And last but not, certainly not least, hello, can you all hear me? About a mile and a mile. Okay. Uh, last but certainly not least, we would be remiss if we did not also recognize the great energies, the vision, and all of the hard work that Catherine Fleming Bruce herself put into this entire program. Um, she is the locomotive behind the train that made this possible, and we owe a mountain of debt to her vision, to her energy, and everything that brought us together. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if, if it wasn't for this team, I wouldn't have been able to to accomplish any of it. So I thank all of you and, and deeply respect all of the wonderful backgrounds that you come from and everything that you bring to the table. Um, I want to thank each of you for joining us tonight, uh, for signing up on Mobilize and watching our program. Uh, it will be, we will put a recorded version on our page and we will also put it on YouTube so everyone will be able to, um, to watch it in case you missed it. So once again, we're going to um, thank you and we close our evening out hoping that you will take joy and courage from how far we have come this past year, uh, what we have survived, where we are now, and be ready to face anything and overcome anything that attempts to stand in the way of justice, equity, and freedom. Thank you all and good night.